Good. Well, it's great to join you all and looking, be looking forward to this. Trusting that uh, tonight and the three weeks after that will, will be a blessing and encouragement and uh, that the Lord would, would help us as we tackle a very difficult topic. Um, but uh, let's, just, let's just pause for prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we, we come to you. Uh, we, we want to handle your word correctly. And we want to have the correct attitudes as well as we delve into this, this difficult topic, this one that has been contentious among many believers. We want to avoid that. We want to pray that there would be a spirit of, of love, cooperation, harmony. And we pray that our desire might be uh, for, for you and for your truth, your word to prevail. Uh, may our hearts all be open and teachable to you. And Father, we, we just place ourselves in your hands. I pray that you would give wisdom. Pray that you would fill me with your spirit, your power. Uh, Father, we pray for each one who will participate. We ask that uh, these times spent together would indeed be spiritually, spiritually profitable and, and build us up, edify us, draw us closer to you, Lord. Make us praise and worship you more and appreciate you and our salvation even more and more. So we commit ourselves to you and we ask for your help now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I was asked to uh, pick up this topic of election and predestination uh, as a result of the book that I, I have written. And I think some of you are familiar with the book and maybe have copies. And uh, I think Brian distributed some, some material ahead of, of time. Uh, it, it certainly was a topic that I used to love arguing about and, and debating. Um, but the Lord gradually revealed to me uh, a problem of pride and that it was pride that, that fostered the desire to prove others wrong and to win arguments at all costs. And uh, I, I'm ashamed when I think back to some of the discussions and, and debates that, that we had. Uh, Proverbs 13 and verse 10 says, by pride comes nothing but strife. By pride comes nothing but strife, and that's very true. Uh, I enjoyed trying to show others where they were wrong, uh, but the Lord started showing me where, where I was wrong. Uh, Obadiah 1 and verse 3 says, the pride of your heart has deceived you. And it's very easy for that to happen. So we certainly have to be on guard. Uh, we can be blinded sometimes by, by our own prejudice. Um, I began looking for real honest answers instead of going to the Bible just to find points and, and verses that would back up what, what I already believed. Uh, instead of just looking for arguments, uh, I, 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 I wanted to let the word speak for itself. And certainly my views changed over a number of years and, and I think the Lord changed me too. I began to realize, firstly, I don't have to always be right. Um, we, can, we can agree to disagree with other believers and fellowship with other believers, even if they see things differently. Um, I also no longer felt the need that I have to convince everybody else to see it my way, uh, but rather to encourage each believer to search the scripture, study the scripture, and to honestly allow the Lord to, to speak. One of my biggest challenges was, I think, to, to move. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to check my slideshow hasn't uh, started playing there. Okay, there we go. I think one of my challenges was to move from a theory of sola scriptura, uh, you know, scripture alone, only the scripture, and, and I, I certainly held that theoretically, but I, I had to move to a position of in practice, allow the Bible to be preeminent in my thinking and, and the Bible alone to, to be the authority uh, in terms of regulating what I believed and, and why I believed it. Um, only the Bible is the inspired word of God. Uh, only the Bible is inerrant. Only the Bible is authoritative. And only the Bible is infallible. And again, uh, you know, when, when we look at the issues and ask, where do we get our definitions of important biblical words? Sometimes it hasn't been from the Bible only. Um, I think for me, one of the growing realizations was we should surely let the scriptures alone define its own words and, and concepts. 
2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Uh, all other human sources need to be checked and rechecked, uh, examined, scrutinized, questioned, uh, and checked for the, the accuracy and truthfulness. And, um, you know, no author or book or preacher or church or council or, or institution should be invested with, with too much uh, trust. We must trust and follow the Lord and his word, not, not people, theologies, or teaching. And in that sense, my, my journey uh, personally was a journey of getting back to the Bible. And I hope that maybe even these studies together will, will reinforce that and be a challenge to, to each one who watches this to get back to the Bible. As, as I went back to the Bible in terms of this election and predestination question, I became unsettled when I realized that I had from my youngest days as a Christian read and heard definitions of important biblical words and just accepted whatever people said. I came across a concept I'd never heard before. I went to somebody, what does that mean? They said, oh, it means such and such. Oh, okay. I just accepted those. Or somebody would give me a book to read or somebody would say, well, look up in the Bible dictionary, look up the, the definitions, and I would just accept it without really questioning it. And I, I did not do the, the hard work of examining biblical words within the actual context of the Bible itself. I did not let the Bible define its own words. I didn't realize that at the time, of course, but I was importing definitions from outside the Bible and superimposing those definitions on, on the Bible. I want to read just a paragraph from page 17 of, of my book, which kind of encapsulates some of my thinking I was going through. Um, I began a thorough reevaluation of the entire spectrum of theology in this area, re-examining hyper-Calvinism, moderate Calvinism, Arminianism, Wesleyanism, and even Pelagianism to be sure I had a thorough understanding of each of these views. I was also searching to find out where the prevailing definitions of election and predestination had originated. I was surprised that I had not previously noticed that some of these teachings had merely been the personal opinions and logical deductions of earlier influential theologians, which were then transmitted through creeds, church councils, commentators, books, preachers, seminaries. Eventually they became the only accepted ways of understanding. These definitions which had been developed along partially philosophical lines outside the biblical con context had gradually been imported into and superimposed upon the Bible. Strong personalities and proof texts then anchored and established these, these definitions in highly structured theological systems held together by to tightly woven logical arguments, making them difficult to question or resist. When I realized that, it really fanned the flame of my growing desire to allow the Bible to define its own terms, to speak for itself. And I began to long to truly discover God's own definitions for the words that he uses in scripture. In other words, what did God intend for those words to mean that, that he used uh, in, in his word? And so that was kind of what set me along my journey in this whole area of, of predestination and election. And it was a long journey. <laughs> it was a complicated journey, uh, perhaps more complicated than what I first thought. And uh, I lost some friends along the way, unfortunately, and parted company with some believers, unfortunately. And I regret that. But uh, the Lord was, was teaching me many lessons, I think, as I went along. So some people have asked me, where, do you, where did you start? to unlearn these concepts and definitions that you were holding and to replace them with a truly biblical understanding of truths like election and predestination, salvation, etc. Well, the first thing I think for me was to, to let go of the definitions that I held up to that point. And I took the word elect, election and the word predestination <clears throat> 
And all of the forms of that, so predestined, predestinated, predestined, um, elected, electing, election, choose, choice, choosing, all of the forms of those words. And I went to uh, English concordances to look up every one of those words. Um, I looked up in the King James Version, the New King James Version, the, the New American Standard, the ESV. Uh, those are the main ones that I used, but I cross-referenced with some others. So I looked up every one of the forms of those words and I made lists. You can imagine that that takes some time. There's hundreds of occurrences, a combination of all those words. But that gave me an overall feel for, for where these words are used and, and basically how these words were, were being used. Um, and so that took some time, but it, it, it was a very valuable experience to see where and how and when the Bible itself uses those words. So then what I did was I took my lists and using a chronological Bible, I reorganized the lists into, into that, that time sequence. So the order in which God revealed those truths, um, because obviously he reveal, revealed them progressively. He didn't reveal everything about every one of those words at the beginning. Uh, re revelation is progressive. And so the Lord built on, on the revelation that he'd given previously. The first time a word is used is always very important. Uh, it's called the law of first reference. And that usually sets the tone, as it were, and the foundation for the understanding of that word. So again, I looked for the first uh, occurrences of, of these words, election and predestination. Uh, the third stage, so I, I um, made a list of all the words, went to concordance, looked them up, uh, put them in chronological order. And then thirdly, I, I examined the context that each one of those verses occurred in. Uh, now that was a huge mammoth task. It took me a number of years. Um, there were three aspects of, of context that, that I did. So where did I start? I used an English concordance to look up every form of the word. I put the list in chronological order. I examined the context, which I'm going to expand in the next slide. And then I looked up the original Hebrew words in the Old Testament and the Greek words in the New Testament. I wanted to be sure that I, I left no stone unturned, that I, want, that I truly was researching biblically. So I wasn't using commentaries. Um, I was just using a personal study and reading and rereading the scriptures, comparing the scripture with the scripture. Uh, and, and I wasn't going to other sources to, to see what does so-and-so say about this or what does so-and-so say about that. Uh, so I, I did that long laborious task of, of looking up each one of, of those words. Now, I'm going to back up here to look at number three, the, the, the three aspects of context. Um, in examining each verse, uh, I, I try to look at the historical context, the theological context, and the grammatical context. So the historical context just asks questions like when, where, and who. When did this happen? Where, where was it happening? Um, who, was, who was the author or speaker? Who were the audience? And how would that original audience have, have understood what was being said by these words? So in other words, you know, looking at dispensational truth was important and what dispensation was the particular occurrence of, of each word. And then the theological context kind of looks at why. Why was the Lord conveying that truth at that time? And, and what was he revealing or teaching in this biblical book or letter or chapter, passage and sentence? And what was the, the, the theological connections there? What other truth was connected with this? And what are the teachings before and after each occurrence? And then the grammatical context just asks what and how. Um, what is said and how is it said? What specific words are used and what forms of the words are used? So looking at things like the tense, the number, voice, inflection, derivation, gender, case, etc. And of course, I was having to use some lexical aids at that point um, and trying to avoid the opinions of those authors, but cross-referencing the number of different sources to try and find, get to the, 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 the essential, what was this original word? How was it used in common usage, uh, comparing biblical usage and so on. Uh, so there were many aspects there looking at uh, things like syntax, sentence structure, uh, phrases and clauses within sentences, and also literature type. Um, what kind of literature 
uh, is was was each word occurring in this a poetry prophecy narrative didactic wisdom literature historical gospels epistles and, and so on so examining those three aspects of of context was a very important step and, and quite an evolved step but i felt that that was very very necessary so as i began to specifically look up this word elect election and so on and uh, the ways that it was used something that that became clear very quickly the concept of election is not always used in exactly the same application sometimes it's in the singular and used of individuals god choosing individuals sometimes it's used in a plural form of a group of people sometimes the exact same words that are used of god choosing is also used of people choosing i guess i've always been taught that there were certain words relating to election that only were used when god chose people but i discovered some of those exact same words are also used in other contexts within the bible of people's choices i found that election is used extensively applied to israel in its past present and future then discovered that the messiah the servant of yahweh is spoken of as elect preeminently he is the elect one of god the beloved of god and i discovered that election is is even used of angels so i think immediately i saw the spectrum of this word is fairly broad so we have to be very careful and diligent in in ascertaining the specific usage in the specific occurrence and the application in each particular context uh, with where the word election occurs with within the bible so th i found this was just a very important step and stage so this gave me an overall general picture at this stage as as things were, were unfolding so i'm just going to back up before we get into the nuts and bolts of specific uh, findings of my process of study and just look at uh, to remind ourselves anyway of the main views and i call them the consensus views the, the the traditionally taught and traditionally accepted views um, and most people would say these are the only two views if you're not one you're the other but but that's not true um, there, there are various nuances with each one of these views um, there's a spectrum of views but just for ease of understanding without trying to oversimplify these are the basic two views the first one is is what we could call conditional individual election to salvation from sin this is is broadly speaking the view of the armenian view and uh, what this view says is that god chose some people for salvation because he foresaw that they would place their faith in him so god chose them because he foresaw that they were going to choose him so faith is the condition that had to be met in order for God to elect in eternity past uh, this individual who would be saved. So that's what's conditional. It's conditional upon their foreseen faith. But it is individual, God choosing individual people, and the purpose of his choosing is for salvation. The second main consensus view is what we could call unconditional individual election to salvation from sin and this is broadly speaking the the calvinist theological position calvinism says that god specifically chose people not on the basis of anything he saw in them there were no conditions he simply for his own wise purposes uh, out of his own self and nature chose certain people to be saved and he either bypassed the rest or some within the calvinistic camp would say god specifically chose other individuals for damnation so he's chosen some to go to heaven and he's chosen some to go to hell and in both cases it reveals his glory and in both cases it fulfills his purpose now some people would go a step further and say that god specifically created certain people for salvation and he created certain people for eternal damnation but it's unconditional it's simply within the mind and the heart 
of God. So those are the two broad views. The common threads between those two views is that God chooses individuals and that election is for salvation from sin. Now, in other ways, these views are very, very different, and there's many points of divergence be between them. Again, as I mentioned, some people say these are the only views, but I certainly would not uh, believe that and, and, and accept that any, any longer, although I would have taught that and, and held that myself at one stage. So in my study then, as I went into the Old Testament to examine election in a little bit more detail, one of the questions that of course I was looking for is, do the consensus views fit what scripture in fact reveals and teaches? So as I came to election in the Old Testament, I was surprised to find no use of the words election, elects, elected, electing, choosing, etc. None of those words were used in the English Bibles in the Old Testament. Also, by the way, in the Old Testament, there are no forms of the English word predestined, predestination, predestined, or whatever. There's no, no forms of that word. Th those words only occur in the New Testament, and there's only four or five occurrences in the whole New Testament. So as I compared four versions, I found in the King James Version, the word elect uh, showed up four times. The word chosen uh, showed up 86 times and the word choice showed up 31 times. Uh, now the, the new, new King James, it was very, very similar. Sorry, I, uh, sorry, the King James, yeah. And then the new King James was very similar, four times, 93 times and 20 times. And then the ESV, the word elect is not used in the Old Testament and the same with the New American Standard, not used. Chosen is used 95 times, 97 times. And then the word choice used 20 and 21 times. So where the word elect is used four times in the King James and New King James, the ESV and, and New American Standard simply opt for the word chosen in that, in that case, which is perfectly legitimate because the word elect and chosen really is interchangeable. Now what I found with the, the four occurrences of the word elect uh, in, in the English Bible, the King James, New King James, all of those occurrences were, were within the book of Isaiah. All those four references were in the book of Isaiah. And you don't have time to, to, take, to, to actually read them tonight, but I'd encourage you to, to do that. Uh, chapter 42 and verse 1 clearly refers to Messiah, the servant of Jehovah. In other words, the uh, coming, uh, a prophecy of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and there we have individual election individual election that is spoken of but it's certainly not to salvation because he is the savior uh, and then you have three references in isaiah that, that are all of the nation of israel being being elect so this is a group uh, that is referred to as elect not individual election so uh, some obvious points immediately came out the consensus views say that election is individual and to salvation. Well, for Messiah, it's individual, but it's not to salvation. In, in the nation of Israel, it's not individual, and it's also not to salvation. So that began to clue me in. Okay, my previously held definitions are not fitting even the beginning of my analysis in the Old Testament. So that began to throw me and made me realize that I had a lot more study to do. Uh, in relation to Messiah, <clears throat> when we survey the biblical teaching, uh, Old and New Testament, in relationship to the Messiah, it's evident that Messiah was chosen as the delight of, of the Father. Uh, he occupies a, a very privileged position as the servant of Jehovah, and he's endued with the, the power of, of God's Spirit, and all of God's promises of redemption are fulfilled in Messiah. And Isaiah tells us something of, of the mission, the task of Messiah. Uh, in chapter 49 and verse 6, he is sent to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel. And then in Isaiah 42 and verse 1, uh, he is to bring forth justice to the Gentiles. And we're also told that he was to be a testimony, a light to the Gentiles, to bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Uh, 
And so it's an interesting point that immediately emerged for me was this. And I'd never thought of this before. But the election of Messiah, though on the one hand completely exclusive, nobody can compare with him, uh, nobody can, he's just untouchable in that sense. He's peerless, right? It's exclusive. And yet the purpose for his election was to bring salvation, not only to the nation of Israel, but also to the, the nations of the world. So his election was to include others, not simply to say, I'm elect, nobody else has any part in this. So that was a point that, that began to emerge that was very significant for me. Um, and then as I looked at the, the, the nation of Israel itself, so just, just a summary slide here, the election of Messiah, to, the privilege of being delight of the Father, the position of being the servant of Jehovah, endued with the power of God's spirit to fulfill God's purposes in redemption, chosen for the task of restoring the tribes of Israel and bringing forth justice to Gentiles, chosen for testimony to be a light to the Gentiles and to bring God's salvation to the ends of the earth. As I begin, began to dig a little bit further here, I discovered that those four times that the word elect occurs in the King James and the New King James, all are occurrences of the Hebrew word bachir. So then when I looked up that word bachir and the occurrences of that word, I found it was actually used 13 times in the Old Testament. So the other nine times that it's used in the King James and New King James, it's translated as chosen. All 13 times it's translated as chosen in the New American Standard and, and the ESV. So there's really no problem or discrepancy there, just a different way of translating the exact same word. Interesting again, as I looked at all of those occurrences, none of those references refer to election, to salvation from sin, not a one of them. Chronologically, the first usage of the word Bach here is in the book of Psalms and refers to David, then to the nation of Israel, and then to Moses. And in each one of those cases, it's very clearly to privilege and to possession. And again, just this realization that was dawning on me, none of these references have anything to do about eternal salvation from sin. Um, there's something else going on here. There was a picture emerging that God's election in the Old Testament was to a particular purpose and to a particular privilege. So purpose and privilege. And in the book, I have a chart that, that outlines those 13 occurrences and each one of them and who is spoken of as elect and why they're spoken of elect in the context uh, in which they, they are spoken of, of there. As we look at the election of Israel that emerges then from, from the study that, thus far, uh, firstly, we see that, that Israel is chosen for tremendous privilege, tremendous privilege. Uh, Israel occupied a position of favor, a highly favored position. They were God's own special people, his favored nation. Moses declared in Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6, the Lord your God has chosen you, elected you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. And Exodus 19 and 5 confirms that you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. So they were protected and provided for by God's power. He promises them that, that he's going to be with them. Uh, he is to them Jehovah Jireh, the provider. He is their strength, their shield. Uh, he is their strong tower. And many references that we could look up to establish that. But no reference to the idea of salvation from sin. There, Israel is also elected for some purposes, specific purposes. They're given the task of representing the living God on earth. They, they were to be an ambassador. Exodus 19 and verse 6, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Priests who would stand in the gap 
between God, the living God, and the nations of the world, representing him and, and teaching, showing his goodness and, and his glory. Um, in Isaiah 43, verses 11 and 12, we see the testimony that they were to, to, to bear. I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, there was no foreign God among you, therefore you are my witnesses, says the Lord God, that I am God. They were the representatives of God. This thought again about the, the, the exclusive, inclusive nature of election uh, occurred to me again in relationship to Israel as it had with Messiah. Messiah was exclusively elect, but his election was not that nobody else could come into relationship with God, but rather that Messiah was to be sent to bring Jews and Gentiles into relationship with God. Likewise with Israel, on the one hand, their election is exclusive. They didn't volunteer for that position and they didn't deserve God's choice. God said, I loved you because I loved you. God sovereignly chose to set his love upon Israel, exclusive. And no other nation could claim that privilege or position. No other nation could say, we'd also like to be a favored nation. No, not, many nations tried to supplant Israel and they couldn't. Uh, so this was very exclusive. But on the other hand, there was an inclusivity about it. It didn't exclude others from believing in God. In fact, other people and nations did uh, come to believe in God and to serve him. And there's some very, very notable inclusions, even in the messianic line of people who came to, who were who not Israelites, who are not of the elect. They were non-elect, but they came to trust in the living God and to follow him. So the purpose of their election was to tell others and show others of the goodness and glory of God, so that in a sense, they would become thirsty for the living God, that they would see the difference between their, their false idols and, and the God that, that Israel served, a uh, task of representing uh, Israel to, to the world. And what a marvelous thing that is. And to me, this was such a, a huge uh, find for me. This was such a huge discovery for me when I, when I came to realize this. But th there were two further things that I, I came to see as kind of a spin-off from this. Many within the elect nation of Israel rebelled against the Lord, rejected him, and departed from him. They were chosen by God. They were elect, but they did not themselves choose to follow the Lord. In fact, only a very few of the elect nation truly followed the Lord. They, they did not fulfill the purposes or the privilege of their election. Um, many Israelites, though elect, were completely disobedient and will be eternally lost. Elect, but lost. But still collectively as a group, the physical nation of Israel is still the elect. And I think it was so clear, became clear to me that the election of Old Testament Israel was not a spiritual election unto salvation, but it was an election based on the fact that they were the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All of Israel was elect, but not all of Israel chose the Lord. The second illustration that I saw of this was the difference that we see between Saul and David. Both were specifically uh, spoken of in the Old Testament as being chosen by God to be king. Even Saul, though he was the people's choice, yet the Lord reiterates very, very clearly in the scripture that God chose Saul. And likewise, God chose David. Both of them were given power and privilege. Both of them had the Holy Spirit come upon them to equip them for their calling and election. Yet look at the incredible differences between these two. Saul ends his life in disobedience and rebellion. The Lord could say of David, though, I have found a man after my own heart, one who will do all of my will. 
Saul could have continued the bloodline of Messiah if he'd been obedient. But he forfeits that. And instead, David continues the bloodline of Messiah and his throne is appointed as the throne of Messiah, an eternal throne. Why, why this purpose given to David instead of Saul? We read in the scripture that David chose the path of faith and obedience, but Saul chose the path of rebellion. Both were chosen by God, but only David chose God. And I think that's a very, very significant illustration. First uh, Samuel 13 and 13 specifically says that the Lord would have established Saul's kingdom over Israel forever. But because of his disobedience, he was told the kingdom has been torn away from you. And first Samuel 15 and 23 says he rejected the will of the, the word of the Lord and therefore he was rejected by the Lord. So, so some very clear lessons there in terms of election and the outplaying of that uh, with, with Saul and David. So some key findings, and I know I'm spending a lot of time right near the beginning of the book, but I think this is very foundational for, to, to understand where, where we're going to go with this. Um, so some key findings. Election doesn't have a one-size-fits-all application. It's used in a number of different settings and contexts. And we need to be careful that we study each context. We've seen the Messiah is the elect servant of Yahweh. We've seen that election can be individual or it can be of a group. Election can be to, to a temporal task that, that doesn't last forever, or it can be for an eternal responsibility. Uh, elect people have responsibility to respond to God's election and to choose to fulfill God's election. Elect people can rebel against God and can forfeit God's election of them. We've seen that the Messiah's election, Israel's election was exclusive and yet also inclusive. It didn't preclude others from coming to faith in the living God. We've also seen that, that ones like Rahab and Ruth and others who were non-elect came to be included in the elect line because they chose to believe in and follow the Lord. They became partakers of the blessings of the elect. And so an evident pattern is emerging that election has to do with God conferring privilege and purpose on the person or the group elected. And I think what that tells us that in, in every occurrence, we need to be very diligent in, in studying the context. And we've also seen that in none of these occurrences does election uh, mean choosing individuals for salvation from sin. So I'm going to just wrap that up there uh, for time's sake, um, because that brings it to me to kind of a natural conclusion here. Um, so hopefully I've laid uh, some good foundations. I encourage you to, if you don't have a copy of the book, maybe get, get one or borrow somebody's uh, and, and fill in some of the details in between. And Lord willing, we'll pick up next week where we've left off here. So Lord bless you. God bless you.